Hugh Forrest and Melanie Newman. All right. All right. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Hugh, for coming, and thanks to all of you uh, for coming to hear the story. Great to be here. Of Welcome South to Austin. Um, so, Hugh Forrest, the Chief Programming Officer for South by Southwest. I am Melanie Newman. I'm the Senior Vice President for uh, Communications and Culture at the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And, and let me be clear, I think we have the order here uh, somewhat mistaken. I should really be interviewing you, but uh, <laughs> I think that's much more interesting than you interviewing me, so well, hopefully I, we'll get a little more of the Planned Parenthood story within the next hour as well. My, my friend Sean knows that I'm uncomfortable in the hot seat, and I feel like <laughs> Oprah over here. Um, well, funny, that's the same thing he told me and uh, said that I should ask you that. So I think we want to get started with a quick video about South by Southwest. Can we cue cool. the video? This, I'm Martin Atkins, and this is South by Southwest. Hmm. Motherfucker. <laughs> the South by Southwest experience for me is this glorious smash up of people. South by Southwest brings together all sorts of amazing backgrounds and interests. Where does that conversation go and what similarities do they pull out of each other that didn't exist before? You can talk to anyone here. That is a fact. The international contingent at South by is significant. You can come and draw for yourself the knowledge that might be empowering. There's so much to know. There's so much to learn. Any moment time you can turn the corner and you can find something new. The whole idea of containing everything and allowing people to explore different areas, I think, is what makes it unique for me. It reminds me of being young. There'd be a bunch of clubs and everyone had their own style and everyone was hungry and everyone was full of dreams. 我对SouthBy,对于世界趋势发展的敏感度非常的印象深刻。The idea of just giving creatives a natural voice, you know, come here and your expression is your expression. Everyone comes here all over the world and being part of that is, is very special. When you get a bunch of artists in one place, magic happens. All right. All right. So, Hugh, you are the chief programming officer for South by, by, South by Southwest. That means you get to decide the content that is expressed at the, at the festival, and you've been doing this since 1987? 89. 89. 89. Uh, I, am, I oversee and work with the staff. Uh, the programming department has about 50 people total. Um, a lot of very, very smart and talented people. Uh, so uh, my role is, again, a little more overseeing. I'm not rubber stamping every single uh, panel or presentation or session or band or film that we have for the, the event, uh, but trying to create a overall vision of the kind of things we want to cover uh, and trying to empower as many folks on, on the staff to, to kind of execute that vision. Can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of history and growth? So you may not be rubber stamping every decision, but adding content pillars to the program over time, you know, I think started out with music, you've expanded to include sure. different types of content, political content now, tech. Uh, can you talk a bit about how the festival has grown? Sure. Uh, we started, South by Southwest started in uh, 1987, so more than 30 years ago at this point. Uh, in 1987, South by Southwest was a music-only event. Um, it was patterned after an event that happened in New York called the New Music Seminar. Uh, and at one point, the organizers of the New Music Seminar were going to come to Austin and start a New Music Seminar South. Uh, that plan kind of fell through, so the, the team that was, liaison, uh, was the lia liaison team to that new music seminar team decided, well, we can just do this ourselves. And um, 
these people, the, that team all worked at the Austin Chronicle, which is our weekly newspaper. They had a lot of great relationships with club owners, uh, which is what you need when you're putting on a music event. Mm -hmm. um, they talked to the various club owners about, we want to do this mu new music festival. Um, it'll be this great thing. And it turns out club owners are a lot more conservative than you might have thought. <laughs> and most of the club owners said, that sounds like a great idea. Come back uh, <clears throat> in two or three or four years when you have a business plan. Um, eventually, they knocked on enough doors that uh, uh, found a small window uh, to work with, and these were club owners who had said, who had said, well, we have one week out of the year, which is our worst week out of the year. Um, we can't do any worse with our club uh, than what we're doing already, so you can, have, you can use my club that week. That, that was <clears throat> spring break week, where you had 50,000 UT students leaving town to go to, to the beach or go skiing. Um, and, and the, most of the clubs were fairly empty then, so <clears throat> South by Southwest came in and filled that void, and within a few years, it was one of the most profitable weeks for most of these clubs. Again, that was a music event. That was 1987. Uh, in 1994, we added uh, what was film and that what was then called multimedia. Uh, and then in 1995, we split those two things out. Um, more recently, and I'll shout out to my colleagues somewhere over there, we added uh, South by Southwest EDU in mm -hmm. 2011, which covers new innovative thinking in the education space. Again, where we are in 2019, uh, somewhat what you saw in the video, we have 22 different tracks of programming, so we cover everything from startups to sports, from game industry, to uh, politicians. Um, we've got space, uh, we've got um, uh, fashion, all kinds of different things. With the, the uh, connecting thread between all these different kinds of tracks and all these different kinds of content, a strong, strong focus on creativity. And that certainly makes sense in Austin, which has been a city that has always celebrated, uh, propagated, focused mm -hmm. on creative endeavors. So it's been a really great match, and from my perspective, a, a incredible journey to be on. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the, the expansion of digital media, social media, I know Twitter launched at South by Southwest in 2007. How, how it's expanded the experience beyond just what happens in Austin? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, social media has certainly been a huge, huge part of the growth of South by Southwest. Um, again, we added this thing called multimedia in 1994. Um, I was tasked with uh, managing this. I didn't really understand what multimedia was. <laughs> it was at that point. Uh, I don't think most of us yeah, understood most, it. Most of us still don't. <laughs> uh, at that point, we were essentially pre-internet. Um, mostly what we're focusing on is CD-ROMs. Uh, we, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the multimedia part. 1994, guys. <laughs> the multimedia part Eventually, our name transitioned to interactive, and then we, more by luck than by strategic design, we were in the right place at the right time with a lot of the early uh, social media pioneers and innovators. Um, and that really fueled our growth. Uh, we, that started in 2004 when we had a gentleman named Jonathan Abrams, who is the founder and CEO of Friendster as a keynote. <laughs> Uh, then, as you mentioned, a couple years later, um, uh, Twitter kind of launched itself by Southwest. I say kind of because they'd already been out for several months. Uh, there was definitely a uh, pre-Twitter South by Southwest and a post-Twitter South by Southwest mm -hmm. in the sense that that really created our, uh, the growth trajectory that we experienced during that time period where all kinds of startups wanted to come to South by Southwest and get that same push that Twitter had received, plus all kinds of VCs. 
two years later, a young Mark Zuckerberg spoke at South by Southwest and somewhat of a disastrous keynote. But <laughs> more to, the, to your question, um, the fact of having social media certainly expanded the, uh, and having so many of these early social media pioneers and adopters at South by Southwest expanded the audience uh, such it was a, a more of a global and worldwide and international audience could see what was happening at the event. Um, and that was, has been a strong part of our growth. <clears throat> I think it's particularly interesting, um, interesting for lack of better term, in terms of where we are in 2019 and soon to be 2020 uh, with social media. This is something that's fueled so much of our growth at South by mm -hmm. Southwest. And certainly, I think almost all of us have a slightly different uh, understanding of social media at this point than we did two or three or four years ago. Well, you know, at one point we thought this was going to connect us all and make us closer and make the world a, a more unified place. There has certainly been some of that, but we also understand um, that social media is a way to target hate speech um, for uh, mm -hmm. these kinds of different groups to connect. And um, that, again, is a whole different, uh, uh, different landscape than where we're at before and makes it particularly interesting to be mm -hmm. <laughs> thinking about programming South by Southwest now and, and what that means. And so that leads me to a, a, another question about audience curation. What, what made South by Southwest the venue for these innovators to want to be present? And then how do you curate an audience that isn't where, where creativity is, is respected but not hate speech or other types of, types of discussions uh, that you might see on social media? How do, you, how do you determine what your audience looks like? Two great questions there. I think that um, to the, quest, the question of why, why South by Southwest, why it grew, why it became popular there, I think there are a lot of different explanations. Um, but I think one that <clears throat> is powerful and interesting to think about is that, uh, again, South by Southwest had started as this music event. And, um, had really gained traction initially as a music event, and, and we, we weren't gaining traction initially as a technology event. I can remember, <clears throat> excuse me, talking many times to my boss when we weren't, weren't growing so much and saying, I just don't think it makes sense to do this tech stuff at South by Southwest. It's just not the same audience. Um, mm -hmm. And we've got, you know, movie stars over here. We've got rock stars over here, and I've got nerds and geeks over here, they just don't <laughs> mix at all. But Merry band of misfits. Yeah, but <laughs> remember that began to kind of flip around 2003, 2004, 2005, where you began to have this very strong and powerful narrative of, of startups. You can mm -hmm. go control your own career. Um, and I think, again, this is one of the things or one of the reasons that South by Southwest grew is we had these... Um, early tech innovator startups who could see themselves on the same stage as musicians and movie stars. And hey, that's, you know, I, I'm finally getting my due. I'm, I'm part okay. of this artistic equation. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, that for our, our trajectory during that time period. Um, to your second question about how you mitigate, moderate, um, uh, things like hate speech within South Bay Southwest. I think we've gotten better, uh, and at this point, pretty good, having uh, tripped a few times on that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do to uh, get the bulk of our content, uh, we uh, pull that from the community. We have a, a interface called the South Bay Southwest Panel Picker, and anyone with a a connection, internet connection, can uh, enter a speaking proposal. Um, this reflects a, uh, a strong idea and belief that the community often understands things a lot better than you do, that the community is often the experts um, as opposed to the organizers. And so this was a way to, for us to 
better receive these ideas at, at this point i.e. for the the panel picker phase that we are just finishing now we got something like 6,000 total ideas um, and most of those are, are uh, you know I think forward-thinking positive ideas as with a lot of social media platforms or I think most social media platforms and this is in a sense social media we have learned the hard way that you have to have a, a vetting system on comments because mm -hmm. uh, we'd see certain sessions have comments that were not particularly positive. Um, again, we've had a few missteps along the way, but learn from those in terms of, well, that would be an interesting perspective to hear. No, it's not, probably not an interesting perspective to hear and, and learn from that. But. Um, uh, again, uh, social media is a big part of our DNA um, and uh, therefore presents some significant challenges moving forward in terms of uh, who do we showcase, what's that next generation of um, uh, inspiring tech leaders. And um, I think that's a little bit harder to find in 2019 and 2020 mm -hmm. than maybe five years ago. So you talked a little bit about missteps. Can you talk about the resilience of the South by Southwest brand, how you've dealt with those missteps and, and come out bigger, stronger, better on the other side. We talked a little bit about Gamergate. Yeah. I don't know how many of you know about Gamergate, but I'd love to hear you tell that story. Well, uh, I think one of the, the, the lessons of the success of South by Southwest, one of the big lessons um, is simply how long the event has, has gone on and that it started in 1987. And um, maybe less so now, but I'll often get emails, talk to people via, uh, at, at events saying, well, you guys just started a few years ago, right? I'm like, well, no, actually <laughs> way back when. And um, we've, we've grown slowly and organically, and that slow and organic growth, inc incremental growth has added up to a, an event that is scaled to be pretty large at this point, and, and um, that's neat. Uh, I think also uh, wh why I bring that up is that that you know when you were doing an event in the 80s and the 90s, um, your your mistakes weren't magnified to the extent that mistakes are magnified now with social media. Um, and we made a lot of mistakes, and they were magnified in their own way, but again, a completely different landscape than what you have now. Um, so it it <laughs> during that time period, you could make a mistake, learn, you know, correct it, learn from it, do hopefully better mm -hmm. the next year. And again, you weren't, um, you weren't uh, broadcast in a, in a way it is now. Flash forward to 2015, fall 2015, about right now. Um, uh, we had uh, an unfortunate um, uh, experience with Gamergate. Um, for those of you who are unaware of what Gamergate is, um, roughly it is a division uh, that started in the gaming community uh, with one camp saying that games uh, should be whatever games want to be and should uh, have male heroes and um, not care anything about um, the world we live in and, and creating a more uh, equitable um, depiction of the world. Uh, the other side saying that games should be socially conscious and uh, should have more representative figures. And that is a very, 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 very <laughs> boiled down mm -hmm. version of what Gamergate is all about. We got embroiled in this because we accepted a uh, speaking proposal that was essentially pro-Gamergate, trying to defend uh, pro side of the, the uh, perspective that games should be able to, gaming, males in gaming should be able to create a gaming world however they want to and not care about this. Um, we then, doubled down on our mistakes by then kicking that panel off the program. Um, and then that, that 
created even more of an uproar within our community, which quickly transitioned to a larger community. We then pulled it back in. It was certainly two weeks out of my life that, um, in retrospect, were you know learned a lot from, but uh, would not wish that kind of trauma on my worst enemies of having um, email blown up, uh, all kinds of people from both sides. And I'm sure you experience this much more in your job than I do in, in mine. Every single day. Yeah, again, <laughs> more interesting person, less interesting person. <laughs> no. Um, but what we, you know, we just, we learned from that, um, the biggest thing we learned from that, and it's the simplest thing, and it appeals to, applies to anybody doing anything, is <clears throat> don't make hasty decisions. If we thought about this decision more, if we thought about the decision, other decisions, if we, you know, come to a decision, okay, let's sleep on it, and if we had more people that we bounced off this, we would have um, probably mm -hmm. taken a different course. Another thing that's um, less universal but also interesting from that lesson is that, you know, every everything we saw there during South by Southwest's uh, episode with Gamergate, which seemed so crazy and ridiculous and how can this be happening and why is this narrative slipping away from us and how can how can't we control this like that that whole thing <laughs> transitioned to the national political stage uh, gamergate is a precursor to the alt-right um, it is uh it was an early lesson in the power of social media and the power of these micro communities to drive a narrative, to create a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it was an early lesson in um, how social media can be used for hate speech. Uh, and you know, we, we like to say in a positive way that South by Southwest and its best days is where you come to learn about the future, where you come to learn uh, to learn the hot new technology in two years, the, the best band in two years that will be uh, breaking in two years, a filmmaker that will break in two years. In this particular case, we were a um, unfortunate uh, pioneer uh, of, of what was to happen with the um, uh, entire nation in two years. And there's some certainly some very interesting um, and informative stories that have been done about Gamergate as a larger thing, not simply at South by Southwest, and how that has informed, in a negative way, the, the rise of the alt-right and mm -hmm. the rise of hate speech and how those early players that, you know, again, started off uh, contained within the game industry uh, or game industry fans went on to, to shape so much of where we are now and so many of the problems that we have now. So in the, in the content, uh, development process, you, you manage a team of 50 people, uh, your team oversees the panel picker process, you decide what, um, what tracks will, will exist every year. What is the, who are the people in the room making that decision? What's the diversity like on your team? And this we is something I just wanna, it's something that has been a, a theme particular, particularly this year at ComNet. Good. And, talking about how we as communicators are thinking about um, creating space and room for diverse conversations and decision makers to ensure that the people are in the room who can say, this might be a bad idea. Sure. Um, we, uh, strangely enough, um, last week and this week uh, is when we do the bulk of our final selection process. Um, so being here and talking to you is a nice respite <laughs> from... <laughs> the pressure is off uh, a little. It's not pressure, it's just <laughs> it's a little bit exhausting. And how that will work is that we'll have uh, a... Um, one day will be one track. So say yesterday was the sports track. We have a track lead who... Um, uh, is responsible for running that meeting, and there'll be four or five other people in that meeting uh, that are making, again, final decisions on 
uh, content that was entered through the panel picker. Um, those final decisions are informed by public voting. The panel picker allows the public to do a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, rating. It also is informed by our advisory board, which rates these things, and it's also informed by staff. The hope is that um, by having four people in the room talking, hopefully there is a robust discussion on every single idea that we're thinking about. This is a great idea because, well, no, I don't think this is a great idea because, mm -hmm. um, and I think that leads to better decisions. Again, we'll, we'll uh, each uh, day, they're probably going over 60 or 70 different ideas. Uh, in terms of your diversity question there, our staff is very diverse in terms of a gender perspective. From an ethnic perspective, we still uh, would like to achieve more diversity there, but I think we have done a lot of that within our advisory board, and that counts for a lot, too. Okay. And certainly, I th um, within the context of, of uh, what you've talked about the themes today, um, we have seen uh, that our community um, very much wants more um, uh, content and programming that is focused on diversity and inclusion. And I think that we've made a lot of steps, um, positive steps in that direction uh, over the last 10 years. I think what's interesting and informative about that, uh, those positive steps is that, you know, 10 years ago, it was a, it was a panel about blogging while black with four black bloggers on stage. Okay, cool, that's neat. And there were some very interesting perspectives there. Um, now I think we've become better skilled at simply uh, not trying to, to, to create these little silos of content like that, but getting more diversity and inclusion on every, every panel and having that and uh, reflecting that in a more positive way that um, that is a, a better look at how our ideal world should be. So let's talk about the future of South by Southwest and, and, and the future ideas. Uh, you talked earlier about South by Southwest really being on the cutting edge. The, who, are, who are the bands that are coming up? What's the technology that's gonna, that we're going to see? What do you think is next for South by Southwest? Do you have any hints on <laughs> the panels and the tracks that we will see at this year's South by Southwest or just generally? What are, what do you think, where do you think we're going uh, in some of these spaces? Well, uh, let me first say that, um, state the obvious that predicting the future is a, a fool's game and um, no one is very good at it uh, and we certainly aren't either, although given the amount of content we do, something that we picked looked amazingly pernicious and that works well. Uh, in terms of some of the stuff that, that's new that we'll be covering for 2020, um, or new and, and covering in more depth, we've got a space track for 2020. One mm -hmm. of the things that's interesting to think about in terms of space is this idea that space in 2020 is beginning to be a little bit similar to where the internet internet type technology was 20 or 25 years ago, that there are more private companies doing it. While it's still incredibly expensive, the, the expenses are beginning to come down and that it's becoming a little more accessible to, um, to more people to uh, get involved with, with um, uh, uh, flights to the moon, the and Mars. the president is creating a space uh, army too. Yeah, well so that too. We're, that's we're coming. Uh, in lockstep <laughs> with that move. Um, we can fight Thanos. <laughs> Sorry, I've been watching Avengers movies with my child. I, so, couldn't, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the interesting idea, concepts there is that um, you know, if you play that uh, comparison out, uh, I mean, can we do better with space exploration than we have done with the internet. Um, mm. And mm -hmm. 
on the one hand, the bar is pretty low in terms of where the internet is. Um, space exploration obviously is a completely different ball game, uh, but are there ways to learn from some of the triumphs from those early mm -hmm. internet years, as well as the missteps and mistakes and, and have a, have a uh, better, um, better outcomes there. Uh, we've also got another track for 2020, which is called Connection and Culture, and that again feeds into this idea, um, which uh, this idea that, that we have more ways to connect with each other through social media in 2019 uh, than we, we have ever before, and yet um, more and more we realize how hollow those kinds of connections are. Um, and uh, uh, there is, uh, by some counts, an epidemic, hard to use that word, of loneliness mm -hmm. in the U.S. and around the world, and that this, this, these hollowness of these social media connections is one of the factors there. Um, I, 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 I'll use that as a little bit of a transition to talking about events like South by Southwest, events like ComNet, and, and the importance of these events in, in terms of where we are in 2019 and 2020, that uh, you know, one of the big ironies of South by Southwest is while we have so much focus on technology um, at this point in our journey, what we inevitably find, and to some degree is surprising every year, is that people who come to South by Southwest, it, it is, the lesson they have, it, it's less about learning about new technology and more about face-to-face -face connections. Mm -hmm. um, talking to someone at a party, having breakfast with someone, having coffee with someone, and that face-to-face -face connection is still extremely powerful. And it's why events like South by Southwest, like ComNet, like ACL this coming weekend uh, in Austin are, are so, so powerful that bringing people together, that face-to-face -face connection is, is always been something that we crave, but even more powerful in 2019 and 2020, um, uh, given the, some of the political uh, and geo geopolitical challenges we have, as well as some of the challenges with social media. I know there are some people in this room who I never, we all live in D.C. and we never see each other. We had to come to Austin to That's hang good. out. So <laughs> Austin's I, a good place to hang out. Austin is a good place. Let's talk a little bit about Austin and South by Southwest and ACL and the Texas Tribune Fest, the impact of those events on uh, the, the growth of Austin, what Austin looks like. I know... Uh, Washington DC and many other cities are going through gentrification. I think Austin is as well. Is is are these events contributing in a for the positive in a positive way for good or for bad? Uh, what is what what is Austin doing these days? Well, that is a great question and it's there layered. Are at least <laughs> There's so many layers. It's <laughs> there like an are onion. At least Peel two layers away. there. Uh, <laughs> Austin uh, ha is one of the f uh, one of, if not the fastest growing city in the U.S. over the last five years, um, and a lot of that, <clears throat> or, or some, or a lot of that growth has been pushed by this festival economy, whether that be South by Southwest, ACL, again Texas Tribune Festival that was last weekend, people coming to the city uh, for a few days, um, experiencing the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. and enjoying the city and deciding to uh, relocate, relocate here. And in fact, it's interesting that our, the South by Southwest big growth spike post Twitter in many ways matches the beginning of the big growth spike in Austin post Twitter. So that's the <coughs> uh, beginning of the, the Austin growth spike in the last 10 years where we became this um, one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. And it's gone, fastest growing means that when I was in uh, high school or college, Austin was a city of 250,000. We're easily a million now with a two million uh, metro area. So that's the positive side. Um, the slightly less positive side is that 
there are more and more features of a boom town in Austin, meaning a disparity, uh, mm -hmm. growing wealth disparity. Um, and uh, it, it, that makes it harder for traditional neighborhoods in the city to exist how they uh, did for many years. It also uh, pushes out a lot of the creative community, whether those be musicians, um, visual artists, playwrights, writers, that type thing, who have made the city as compelling um, or such a compelling place to live. And so that's certainly one of the city's challenges moving forward. Um, and again, uh, the, the, the kind of yin and yang between the city and, uh, and South by Southwest is, is very real. We have that same challenge at South by Southwest where we've gone from a uh, event that's very affordable to attend and therefore attracted a, a younger, more creative audience to an event that is not quite so affordable to attend and uh, harder for creatives to, to come to the event and a little more geared towards um, CEOs. Uh, there are no easy answers to these mm -hmm. questions, uh, to these problems of how do you, um, how do you uh, to, uh, stave off that, that income disparity. Um, I know we have a lot of strategies at South by Southwest to try to get younger audiences in, to try to reach out to um, uh, communities that can't otherwise afford to attend. Um, how that works at the sea level is even more complicated. So when you, I just wanna go back a little bit to, to the audience curation and the, the preserving access. What are some of the strategies you have in place now to, to get people in the door who, if you can dig a little deeper deeper there. Sure, uh, in, in the audience curation, trying to get more, um, more diverse communities uh, into the event. Uh, we have been pretty successful over the last few years at uh, uh, working with a lot of uh, stakeholders in the, the HBCU community, historically black, uh, colleges and universities and gotten several groups coming into South by Southwest for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have significant uh, attendee discounts, registration discounts for students, mm -hmm. um, uh, various other scholarship programs to try to get uh, the kinds of people, kind of micro-target um, kinds of people who can't otherwise attend the event. Uh, there's still a long way to go there, but I think that um, what we've done is, is pretty compelling. So uh, do the UT students now stay uh, <laughs> in Austin for spring break? Do they spend their spring breaks here for South by Southwest? Uh, I think I, I think, would, I don't. I think uh, <laughs> the, the bulk of UT students, or a lot of UT students are still going uh, away at spring break. Um, yeah. But it's also important to note that um, at any event like South by Southwest, like ComNet, you have um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. In our case, we're probably 3,000 volunteers, and they're essentially running the show on site. Um, they are doing all the directing of traffic, manning doors, that type thing. Um, you know, somewhere between yeah. 20 and 30 percent of our volunteers come from uh, UT and ACC and, and Houston Tillotson. Uh, for these volunteers, these student volunteers, um, it is a great social opportunity. You meet mm -hmm. lots of friends this way, uh, new friends this way. But uh, for a lot of them, it is also a calculated, uh, you know, and strategic career move where I'm sure they, can, they meet lots of CEOs. And they can meet CEOs. Hollywood they can attend sessions that will help them mm -hmm. on their career path. Um, so it is, I think, a, a, a mutually beneficial relationship. That's a great opportunity. So we have a little bit of time left, and I think uh, we have a microphone, a mic runner in the audience. If there are any questions for Hugh from the audience join the conversation with us and please give your name and, and where you're coming from. Hi, my name is Haley um, and I'm with Additive, a brand consulting firm. We do a lot of work with the city of Memphis, so I've definitely been following Austin quite a bit as it relates to South by Southwest. I am curious, you did touch on this in some ways in the conversation around accessibility and making sure um, all uh, people can sort of participate, but I am curious how you retain the authenticity 
of the festival as it's scaled and it's gone from its roots in creatives to being more corporate. Um, how do you protect and preserve and promote the authenticity of the festival as, again, it, it does scale and grow? Well, I think that a great question about trying to preserve the authenticity. I think that that is certainly one of the, the biggest challenges uh, as we have been lucky enough to scale and grow. Um, yes, South by Southwest has gotten more corporate in a lot of ways, but there are still lots and lots of <coughs> less corporate elements involved. I think the, the uh, the idea of, of taking most of the content from community input, uh, from, from that community in through, input through the panel picker is, is a way, um, a strong way that we retain that community tie. Uh, we also, you know, do a lot to try to break what is this very, very large event down into a smaller, more intimate event. Um, I certainly, uh, I'm lucky enough to get invited to speak at events like this because of the scale of South by Southwest. And, and that's neat that we've been lucky enough to grow to where we are. But, you know, the truth of the matter um, is that uh, quantity is the enemy of quality. Um, and that the larger your event becomes, the, the harder it is to uh, retain that authenticity. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, I, I'm a, an equally big fan of, of uh, events that are more intimate, that are smaller. Um, I think that we, uh, we all know or that uh, the most important thing that you uh, get an event, get at an event, um, uh, there, there can be lots of sessions with good information and that's, that's great. But always more important is the connections you make, the networking connections you make, whether that's at a party, whether that's standing in line at Starbucks, whether that's waiting for a cab, whether that's in a hallway somewhere. And certainly it is easier to make those connections uh, at smaller um, type events uh, or smaller type events within a larger event. We've done, uh, we added a lot of meetups to South by Southwest over the last mm. probably five years. Um, uh, and it was something that I'd always thought, well, we don't need to do that. People can figure out on their own how to, to meet their tribe or, or meet other tribes they want to meet. And I was dead wrong on that. Um, creating a kind of structure where, uh, people, uh, feel safe with their tribe or feel safe to meet other tribes has been a, uh, has been one of the big wins for us um, uh, over those, uh, the last few years. And so again, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, to your, your question, retaining that authenticity is incredibly hard to do. And we certainly have plenty of critics who say that the event is too big and has become too corporate. Um, at my end, I uh, am satisfied that the focus, while the event has transitioned, um, significantly over the 30 years, gone from this small music or relatively small music event to an event that covers politicians and covers uh, sports, food, all these different verticals. That focus on creativity is still the through line between past, present, future, between all these different verticals that we cover. Thank you. Do we have another question from the audience? Hi. Okay, I have two questions, Hugh, and one is super easy and the other is a little more complex. So first of all, to dovetail off can of... You, sorry, can you tell us who you are? Yeah, sorry. Thank My you. name is Marissa Kaiser. I work at Casey Family Programs in Seattle, Washington. Um, so the first question is, where do you spend your time if you had the choice between all the tracks, especially looking at 2020, and if you could pick a moment of time, where would you have liked to have been in what room and where? Um, and I'll reserve my second question till the answer. So that was the easy question or the hard that question? That was the easy <laughs> question. I was thinking the same thing. That <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Um, the experience of a organizing event, and I'm, uh, I probably have all organized events in the, in the room, is, is certainly 
different than attending an event, I will typically pop into a room, um, uh, watch for two or three minutes, try to get the vibe, um, is it going well, uh, and then you know, try to, to pop into the next room and realize we've got 30 or 40 different rooms going on. The things that interest me most, uh, I'm certainly very interested and intrigued by this space stuff that we're doing. And a lot of that is just because, again, in a world that, <clears throat> in a world that we have lost some degree of uh, inspiration and aspiration over the last few years, you know, that idea of, of reaching higher still has a lot of value to it. And think of this summer when we're thinking mm -hmm. about the 50th anniversary of the, the, the moon landing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a point in time that we can, yeah. you know, I, like it or not, we can say, well, um, that was really neat. Uh, and We were shooting yeah, yeah. for something. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's kind of what we're shooting for on the, this space track. And I'll, I'll spend a lot of time there for 2020. It's always as well, if I've recruited a particular speaker, um, it's great to go pop in on their session and see how they're doing, try to introduce myself, that type thing. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of get the, the, the um, potpourri version of the event. Now to the, now to the difficult question. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, so we're all communications professionals, and you've talked about the different life cycles of South by Southwest. Um, there was a dot-com revolution. There was a social media revolution. So just I wanted to hear your take on, um, especially in this day and age of social media, what is uh, South by Southwest's embrace of letting go in order to increase conversation? I think a lot of us work in philanthropy, and there's a decent amount of holding tight to the message. Can you tell me more about, <clears throat> give me more context on the letting go? Um, I worked for a, a communications consulting firm a decade ago and I left because I wanted to work for a technology company who embraced social media because all of my nonprofit clients were shunning the opportunity because they wanted to stick with the press release and the press event right. to control the message. And I know that's certainly not the day and age we live in now, and South by Southwest has always seemed to me as an organization that has embraced this creativity, this innovation, and also this chaos. Um, <laughs> great question, or, or... That was the hard one. That was the hard one, and you've got me completely stumped there. I think uh, when, we, when we talked uh, in our pre-conversation, you talked a little bit about, um, and maybe I'm, I don't want to mischaracterize your question, but you talked a little bit about the, the chaos that has come from social media and the importance of creating space for the face-to-face -face conversations because people are looking for that. So I think what you're asking is about the, the letting go of something, of the technology that we had so desperately craved to bring us closer. Is that what you're? Uh, it's really about a control of the message. Ah, right? I see. How does South by Southwest I see. Huh. I see. Uh, yes. Um, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for the clarification and, and, and further context there. Uh, I, I think this is something we wrestle with, or I know this is something we wrestle with a lot. Um, and my strong belief um, is, <clears throat> again, that this power of community, that the community understands our event um, and uh, understands what is compelling in, in more ways sometimes than we do. There are other parts of the company who um, have equally strong and eloquent arguments that, you know, we need to, to the community has one thing, but we need to better uh, form what our message is and get that narrative out there as opposed to letting the community define us. And that has certainly been uh, some of where we've tripped up when the, the community is defining us and we're kind of like, 
to what you say, let go of that message. Um, I think that, again, uh, the more we can emphasize that South by Southwest is a, has a strong, strong focus on creativity, um, uh, the, the, the better the outcomes we have. And I, I think that that message about creativity is particularly uh, important in terms of um, where we are in 2019 and 2020 as we enter more deeply into an age where um, more and more computers, algorithm robots are doing more and more things. And, and creativity is what really makes us human. And, and what separates us from those machines and algorithms. And, and they can do a lot of really great things that we used to be able to do. We can still mm -hmm. synthesize ideas, uh, create new ideas by pulling together very, very different things. And, and the fact that so much of South by Southwest is focused on creativity in a very creative city, uh, I think that is a very strong message that we can push now and in the future that can help guide us and can help tell our audience what to expect in Austin in March. So we are running out of time. I have one last question. It's the very last question, I promise. 30 <laughs> seconds. 30 seconds. Tell, tell us a little bit about the power of storytelling in the space that is created at South by Southwest for storytelling? That's not an easy question, but 30 seconds. <clears throat> <laughs> I think that storytelling, um, uh, this is not quite as eloquent an answer as you, wanna, uh, as you want, but we are always amazed that some of the most, many of the most popular sessions are storytellers talking about their craft and how that works, how they're able to get a message out there. Um, uh, we have a, a track called Experiential Storytelling, which mm. kind of weaves mm -hmm. in new technology into that idea. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're all storytellers in a way. And again, it's amazing how much that, uh, that idea, that message, that concept um, uh, aligns with our community. Well, thank you so much thank you. for telling the story of South by Southwest. And thank, thank you, you all for listening to it and coming to the session.